Hey everybody, this is Michael Altos recording the first lecture of our new semester. We're going to start with the cardiovascular system uh, part uh, lecture one, which is on vasodilators and antihypertensives, and this is part one of that series. The first thing we're going to do is review a few different classes of medications that we discussed last semester. Uh, the first is uh, alpha antagonists. We discussed those last time. There was phentolamine and phenoxybenzamine. We said that these were uh, alpha, alpha receptor antagonists, and almost always they're used for the management of pheochromocytoma. They block the action of the catecholamines that the pheo is secreting from the adrenal uh, gland. And we even said that these drugs aren't being used quite as across the board as they used to be. So you might see a patient coming in for a pheochromosoma, pheochromatoma pheochromocytoma resection uh, who hasn't been put on these medications. Uh, I also reminded you that while being an alpha-1 blocker is the main effect, they block the action of norepinephrine and epinephrine at the alpha-1 receptor and that helps them bring down the blood pressure. But since they're non-selective, they block the alpha-2 receptor as well and that actually causes um, a breakdown in the negative feedback system. And so we get an enhanced release of norepinephrine which can lead to some tachycardia. And so the side effects we see with the alpha antagonists include reflex tachycardia, orthostatic hypotension, and some colonomimetic side effects as well, uh, the GI side effects, uh, which could be treated with atropine or glycopyrrolate. Uh, these patients, remember, could have some unrecognized volume depletion, uh, and so they may need some volume resuscitation in the operating room. Also remember that since these patients are alpha-blocked, if they get a beta agonist, they may actually become hypotensive because the primary effect will be beta stimulation, which decreases diastolic blood pressure. We also talked about beta, anta beta antagonists, beta blockers, last semester. We talked about the non-selective beta blockers like propranolol, um, which have side effects in the lungs like bronchospasm, as well as concerns for CHF. And we also talked about the beta-specific antagonists like metoprolol, atenolol, and esmolol, which is the short-acting of the three. And while CHF is a concern with those as well, uh, we don't see as much of a concern about um, bronchospasm. For all beta blockers, we also have concerns, obviously, about bradycardia and AV heart block. Um, and there's possibility for some hypotension, which is probably mediated by the decrease in myocardial contractility and heart rate, and even some decreased renin release in the system, which we'll speak about in a little bit. Beta blockers are popular because even though they make the heart work uh, less efficient, efficiently, they also reduce your myocardial oxygen demand. And that's why a lot of patients who are at risk for coronary disease are placed on beta blockers. We also learned about the mixed alpha-beta antagonists most specifically labetalol, which has alpha and beta activity. And so it's a good drug that will lower blood pressure and decrease heart rate as well. Uh, we don't see any reflex tachycardia. We actually see bradycardia from the beta component, as well as lowered blood pressure from the alpha component. And we remembered that there is carvedilol, which is coreg, and that's a medication people usually take orally, which has a lot of the same properties as labetalol. And we talked about clonidine last time, uh, which is an alpha-2 agonist. And even though it's an agonist, it drops blood pressure. And how does it do that? Well, it works in the CNS to decrease sympathetic output at these presynaptic alpha-2 receptors. And this is a drug that people take when they have some pretty bad hypertension. And when people stop taking the drug suddenly, they can get rebound hypertension, which can be very severe. And usually we treat that with some sort of a vasodilator just to get them under control. But clonidine we've seen in many different places. Um, people have used it as analgesics and as uh, pre-anesthetic sedating medications. People have mixed it into their regional and neuraxial anesthetics. It's even been used to treat opioid withdrawal and post-operative shivering. One other drug I just wanted to throw in here. I put it in parentheses because I wouldn't test you on it, but I do see patients taking this drug once in a while. And that's methyl dopa, also known as aldamet. And this is a drug used for treatment of hypertension, particularly pregnancy-induced hypertension. It seems to be pretty safe 
in the uh, uh, in the pregnant patient as far as fetal safety is concerned. Methyl dopa acts at dopa decarboxylase. Remember, we learned that all the catecholamines are pretty much related to each other, and the conversion from dopa to dopamine uh, is is uh, catalyzed by dopa decarboxylase, and that's where uh, methyl dopa works. So it actually lowers your blood pressure by lowering catecholamines. And then it also gets metabolized into an alpha-2 agonist, so it acts like clonidine. So if you ever see a patient on methyl dopa, even though it sounds like a Parkinson's drug, um, its primary use is frequently for uh, treatment of high blood pressure. And finally, hydralazine. <coughs> Now, we haven't really discussed hydralazine very much yet, so we're going to focus on this in just a little bit more detail. Hydralazine is a direct vascular smooth muscle relaxer. It's a direct vasodilator. It works in the arterioles more than the veins, uh, and the biggest effect we see in coronary circulation, cerebral, renal, splanchnic circulation. It decreases diastolic more than systolic blood pressure, but overall it does drop blood pressure, and it's very effective. Hydralazine is most notable for its reflex tachycardia. There may be some direct effect on increasing heart rate, but certainly as it drops blood pressure, the heart rate will naturally rise, and we do see reflex tachycardia. The dose of hydralazine is anywhere between 2.5 and 10 milligrams IV. I probably usually start at 5 for most people. Uh, it comes in a, usually you have to give it with a TB syringe because it's usually 1 milligram, I'm uh, sorry, it's, it's 20 milligrams in 1 milliliter, so it's very concentrated. The hydralazine actually takes about 10 to 20 minutes to start working. It's not a fast-acting drug, and I would not consider it your first-line treatment for most cases of intraoperative hypertension. Uh, it also lasts for three to six hours and can be somewhat unpredictable. So this is a drug that uh, can be used to treat uh, chronic hypertension, a patient who hasn't taken their blood pressure medications that day, but usually not for treating a hypertensive emergency that needs to be resolved right this second. In parentheses, I put minoxidil, another drug that I wouldn't test you on, but uh, minoxidil is an oral medication which acts a lot like hydralazine and causes reflex tachycardia. And this is another drug that if someone's taking it, you know they've got some pretty bad hypertension. Uh, it can uh, also be used in the treatment of fluid retention or edema or pericardial effusion. And the interesting thing about minoxidil, in case you didn't remember, is its brand name is uh, Rogaine which means it causes hypertrichosis or hair growth, and that's actually how the drug was discovered to be a hair growth drug, is when people were taking it for their blood pressure. So that's the review of our previous medications with the addition now of hydralazine, and we're going to stop here and pick up on the next video.